Call Time Spoiler Season 2021 is in full swing. Now, I'm a little bit late to the game, so we're going to use this first video to go over all of the first week's spoilers uh, in the first week of January for Call Time. And then after this, we'll have more videos coming out day to day to try to keep up with each of the spoilers that come out on a day to day basis. So this is going to be a huge hefty video going over all of the cards from the first week that were spoiled. Let's get to it. The first one is Invasion of the Giants. This came out last Wednesday. Uh, this is a saga, enchantment saga, for one red and one blue mana. Uh, page one, you scry two. Page two, you draw a card. Then you may reveal a giant card from your hand. When you do, Invasion of the Giants deals two damage to target opponent or planeswalker. Page three is the next giant spell you cast this turn costs two less to cast. Now, this spell is pretty incredible. For only two mana, you're scrying two, you're drawing a card, you're hitting something for two damage, and you're potentially decreasing the cost of a giant by two mana. So this does a lot for only two mana, and the fact that it is an uncommon is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, also, even, even if you don't utilize, like, say, Chapter 3, the fact that this can be flickered with, like, a Yorian or something like that and add even more advantage... Is pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure if this card will see constructed play, but it does provide a lot of value at only the two mana slot, so I wouldn't be surprised. Moving on, we've got the Thursday spoilers. First up is Frostbite. Now, Frostbite is a snow instant for one red mana. It deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker, and if you control three or more snow poem, uh, if you control three or more snow permanents, it deals three damage instead. Uh, this is pretty awesome, right? This is a shock that can be a lightning bolt if you have three or more snow permanents. Uh, I see this being run pretty heavily in decks that are utilizing snow, um, especially in monocolor decks where you have no downside to just running all of your basics as snow basics. Uh, everyone's going to be running this. So really, really cool piece of removal, and uh, I really like it. Moving on, we've got Masked Vandal. Now, Masked Vandal is a two-drop, one-three shapeshifter with Changeling. It's for one green and one. When Masked Vandal enters the battlefield, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard. If you do, exile target artifact or enchantment and opponent controls. This seems crazy. Changelings are going to be nuts. Now, obviously, you need to have something in your graveyard to remove in order to get the exile clause for an artifact or enchantment. But just having a true drop shapeshifter in an environment that really cares about tribal themes and really cares about uh, party themes as far as standards concerned after Zendikar Rising, like shapeshifters with Changeling are going to do so much. And uh, you'll see when we get to some of the later, the later spoilers, like Changelings make a huge, huge impact, I think, in this format moving forward. So having a two drop is really, really great. Let's move on. The next card is Serolf's Packmate. Now this is a 3-3 three, three for 4 mana. It's 1 green and 3. It's a creature wolf. When Serolf's Packmate enters the battlefield, draw a card. Uh, you can foretell this card for 2 mana, and then you can play it uh, from exile, once it's foretold, for 1 green and 1. Uh, really cool draw piece. Uh, it's going to be really great and limited. Uh, play it, draw a card, it replaces itself. Uh, that's never a bad thing. Uh, where this can really take off is if you have upside to foretelling cards. If there are other cards in the set where you're able to foretell cards for cheaper or you're able to gain some extra bonus by foretelling cards, a card like this where you're cantripping and drawing a card to replace it anyway can make those synergies really busted. So uh, as it stands, it's a really cool card in limited. Uh, draws a card to replace itself and puts a body on the field, but if there's ways to really break foretell, this card could actually see constructed play. It's pretty cool. Moving on, we've got Augury Raven. Augury Raven is a 3-3 flying bird for one blue and three mana. Uh, you can foretell it for one blue and one. So this guy's pretty cool, right? If you draw him later in the game, you just drop him as a 3-3 flyer. Uh, if you get them early and you have the extra mana, you just pay two to tuck them aside, and then later on, you foretell them. Um, great limited 
great limited card. Flying is, is amazing and limited, so this is definitely a card that's going to get drafted. And uh, again, it really depends on how deep they go with the foretell mechanic to really see how busted cards like this can be made. If you can get this in for super cheap or trigger a bunch of extra synergies by foretelling it, this could see constructed play. Um, as it stands right now, it's just a really great limited card. But again, we'll see how those foretell synergies shake out in the end. And uh, who knows, this might, this might see constructed play. Moving on. We've got Behold the Multiverse. Now, this is an instant for one blue and three mana. You scry two, draw two cards. And again, you can foretell it for one blue and one. Instant speed card draw is pretty good. Instant speed card draw that you can scry two before doing is even better. The fact that you can foretell this and then play it at a later date uh, for only two mana is kind of nutty, I think. I mean, granted, you have to commit to foretelling this for two mana at you know on your turn you can't do it at instant speed at the end of your opponent's turn but once it is set aside with the foretell mechanic you can foretell it at instant speed so you could theoretically play this in a blue deck hold up counter magic and then if you don't need to counter anything just play it for the two mana from exile scry two draw two cards that seems really really good um i wouldn't be surprised to see this in certain constructed decks, specifically uh, control decks. Um, but it's definitely going to be great in any of the foretell decks in limited, for sure. Moving on, we've got Glimpse the Cosmos. Now, this is a sorcery for one blue and one. Uh, it's an uncommon. Look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. As long as you control a giant, you may cast Glimpse of the Cosmos from your graveyard by paying one blue rather than paying its mana cost. If you cast Glimpse of the Cosmos this way, and it would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. Uh, this is freaking cool. You get a, any card you want from the top three, and then you get to cast it a second time for only one mana if you have a giant. Uh, one of the things that's really easily overlooked about this card is the fact that changelings are making a big comeback, right? So if you're playing with changelings in your deck, uh, you can still cast this again from your graveyard for one mana, which seems a little nutty. Uh, being able to draw one from the top three twice for a total of three mana is incredible card selection and decent card advantage as well. Uh, and also getting to cast two sorceries to trigger things that care about casting uh, like two cards in the same turn or care about how many times you cast a sorcery. Um, there are cards like those that exist in standard and this can trigger those those sorts of cards twice so this card's really cool and um it might see play moving on we've got inga rune eyes now this is a legendary creature human wizard it's a three three for one blue and three colorless when inga rune eyes enters the battlefield scry three when inga rune eyes, rune eyes dies draw three cards if three or more creatures died this turn it could be cool the fact that it's legendary kind of holds it back, but if you're looking to fill your board with creatures and have some sort of uh, uh, wipe support or wrath support where like if they wipe your field, uh, you gain a bunch of card advantage back to help you recover, uh, this card does that in spades. So it really depends on the deck you're playing. It has to go in the right deck where you're looking to go wide. Um, it could also go in decks where you're looking to wipe, wipe the board yourself but also fill the fill the board with creatures, in which case you gain more from wiping your side uh, while also wiping their side. So there's a lot of interesting ways this card could be used, and I'll be interested to see if it ends up in any constructed decks uh, following the re release of Call Time. But uh, moving on from this guy, we've got Call the Forge Master. Now this is a 2-2 Dwarf Warrior, it's a legendary creature, for one red and one white, so it's Boros colors. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, if it was enchanted or equipped, return it to its owner's hand. Creature tokens you control that are enchanted or equipped get plus one, plus one. Now, it seems like this guy works really well with Nahiri from the last set, from Zendikar Rising. Um, the first ability allows you to save all of your non-token creatures just by equipping them with things. Um, and if you can get some kind of extra value by equipping creatures that have enters the battlefield abilities, you then get those creatures uh, 
back in your hand and can recast them and re-trigger their enters the battlefield abilities a second time. So that, that first ability can be really powerful in a deck that's focusing on having enough equipment uh, to really make it constantly pay off. And then the second ability works really, really well with Nahiri's ability to make a warrior token and attach a, a, an equipment to it for free. So creature tokens you control that are enchanted or equipped get plus one, plus one. This, this I think, has enough going for it that it leads me to believe that an equipment-themed deck is going to be able to work in standard moving forward. It'll be interesting to see the rest of the cards come out, but this is absolutely a core card that belongs in the Dwarf Warrior equipment-based Boros deck that clearly uh, Nahiri and Winoda are going to be all about. So it'll be interesting to see see how that deck comes together. This card's really cool. Moving on, we've got Binding the Old Gods. Destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls at page one. At page two, search your library for a forest card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Page three, creatures you control gain death touch until end of turn. Now, what's great about this card is it doesn't even matter what page two and three do. What I see this is, as is four mana, destroy a non-land permanent, and then this thing sticks around for a couple turns, giving you a chance to either flicker it or return it to your hand to recast it. It is potentially reusable removal that gets rid of any non-land permanent, and that is so powerful. Not only that, the fact that page two will fetch you a land, ramp you, thin out your deck is also really good. And the fact that page three just gives everything death touch is honestly kind of gravy. But if you're playing a deck that's uh, aggro and really going wide with small creatures, giving them all death touch at just the, cor the correct moment, the key turn in the game to make it really hard for your opponent to not block them uh, and lose a bunch of his creatures is, is really clutch. So I don't see page three really mattering as much as the other two. Um, because it's it's kind of situational, but there are definitely going to be situations where that third ability really matters. Um, and any kind of reusable or potentially reusable removal is really powerful. So this card is freaking awesome, and especially at Uncommon, I'm super excited to play with it. It'll absolutely go in like Salti control decks or any kind of control decks that have Golgari in the mix. Um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of decks pop up that want to use this card. Moving forward, we've got Old Growth Troll. This is our first rare of the day. Now, this is a 4-4 Trample for only 3 green mana, and it's a Troll Warrior. When Old Growth Troll dies, if it was a creature, return it to the battlefield. It's an aura enchantment with Enchant Forest you control, and Enchanted Forest has tap, add 2 green to your mana pool. It also has pay 1, tap it, and sacrifice this land, create a tapped 4-4 green troll warrior creature token with trample. This card is freaking nuts. Uh, in mono green, it's an auto include. Like, you get a 4-4 trample for 3, which is already insane. It dies and becomes ramp, speeding you along to get out something bigger, and then at any time when you don't need that ramp, you turn it into another 4-4 trampler. Like, it's insane card advantage. Not only that, but there's added tech where, while it's an aura enchanting a forest, if you can flicker it somehow, that it's going to come back into play as the old growth troll. It's going to leave play, come back, it's not going to know it was an enchantment, it's not going to know it was an aura, it's going to come back in as the original 4-4 trample old growth troll. So I can definitely see a deck trying to break this by having flicker effects, reusable flicker effects, where you put the ore on a land and then you turn it back into to a troll. And you just keep trading with things, keep turning it back into a troll, and you gain tons of card advantage. Like, there's so many cool ways to use this card, and I think it's really awesome. Anyway, moving forward, we've got Varagoth, Blood Sky Sire. Now this is a 2-3 legendary creature demon rogue for one black and two mana. It has death touch, and it also has Boast, and Boast allows you to pay one black and one colorless when you attack with it, but only once each turn. Uh, target player searches their library for a card, then shuffles their library, 
and puts that card on top of it. This seems really cool. Now, granted, it's kind of a do nothing when you play it. You pay it, you play it for three mana, right? It comes down and it doesn't really do anything that turn. It has to survive. But the fact that it has death touch means they can't block it without losing a dude. And you still get to tutor, even if they do block it, because the boast ability activates when it attacks, not if it gets through for combat damage. So being able to have reusable tutor that at the very least is going to kill something of theirs if they try to block it, something of theirs that at least has three power or more, or else Varagoth gets to stay around. Um, I feel like in the right deck, this guy could be really abusable. Uh, the fact that he's a demon rogue is really cool too. I feel like maybe there's some kind of a death touch rogues deck coming. Um, there are... A decent amount of cards with death touch that are rogues so i feel like there's some support for that archetype but it's just not at the same place that it needs to be to be worth running over like mill rogues right now but a card like this could potentially see death touch rogues kind of start to take off hard to say i want to love this card feels bad that it does kind of nothing the turn it comes down, but there's potential for this thing to really take off. So it'll be interesting to see if it goes somewhere. Uh, next card is Elvish Warmaster. Now this is a 2-2 Elf Warrior for one green and one colorless. It's a rare. Whenever one or more other elves enter the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 green elf warrior creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn. Uh, pay seven mana, Elves you control get plus two, plus two, and gain death touch until end of turn. Now, this is a powerful card. Um, how powerful remains to be seen. Now, obviously, it has a mana sink for the late game. It has a way to essentially give your elves a modified version of almost like an overrun effect. Um, but really, it's being able to go wide and get an extra elf each turn that really matters with this card. And it being a 2-2 two, two for 2, it already has, you know, normal on-rate stats. So it's absolutely worth running in any elf deck. Uh, it's probably not worth running in anything other than, than a deck that's really hyper-focused on elves because you want to make sure you're getting the trigger every turn. But in a deck that's trying to go wide with elves and really trying to maximize elf synergies, uh, I could see this card being used. Uh, it's also of note that it's a warrior, so it could theoretically help help party themes, but with the fact that the ability only triggers on elves, uh, I don't think that's going to be a thing. Uh, I really think this guy will only be used in decks that are really going deep into the elf theme and really try trying to maximize their synergy. But an interesting card for sure. Moving on, we've got Sigrid God Favored. Now this is a legendary creature human warrior. It's a 2-2 for two white and one colorless. It's a rare. It has flash, it has first strike, it has protection from god creatures, and when Sigrid God Favored enters the battlefield, exile up to one target attacking or blocking creature until Sigrid leaves the battlefield. This thing does everything. The fact that you can flash it in as a first striker, block something, and not have to trade with it if it's also a 2-2 or, or lower, of course, um, the fact that it has protection from gods, so you could flash it in and block a god creature, or it just can't be targeted by gods with there being so many gods in this set. The fact that all of the changelings in this set count as gods, and it has protection from changelings in that way, is really, really cool. And the fact that you get to exile things at instant speed, granted you can only exile them during combat, but being able to exile them at instant speed allows you to do some really nutty things. For example, if your opponent's swinging in at you with an Ember Cleave, and they're instantly using en Ember Cleave during combat to make it cost less with their attacking creatures, uh, you normally can't use a card like, say, Skyclave Apparition to save you from that. Uh, whereas with Sigrid, you can. You can respond to the Ember Cleave by exiling the creature they put the Ember Cleave on and completely blow them out. So, even though I think... Skyclave Apparition is a better card than this overall. Um, this is really interesting, and there are instances where this is going to be straight up better than Skyclave Apparition. I think this card is really, really cool, and I think it's going to be best when there's a playset of these alongside a playset of Skyclave Apparitions, and you're really going to town with your removal on a stick. 
Uh, super fun card. Can't wait to try it out. Uh, next card is our first mythic of the day. Now, this is Aurund, God of Cosmos. This is a 5-drop, 1-1 one, one legendary creature god. Uh, Alrund gets plus 1, plus 1 for each card in your hand and each foretold card you own in exile. At the beginning of your end step, choose a card type. Then reveal the top two cards of your library. Put all cards of the chosen type into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Or in any order, rather. Um, so this card seems a little bit underpowered as far as the gods are concerned, especially as far as the mythic gods are concerned. Um, I can see a world where this is powerful and where this card gets put to good use. Um, the fact that it can get so big, uh, the fact that it really helps you get so much card advantage over time could be really, really great. Um, it remains to be seen just how powerful Fortel will be. And I think it really depends on the more powerful uh, the Fortel mechanic ends up being and the more synergies there are with Fortel, I think the better this card will be. Um, so it's really hard to judge right now. As it stands in a vacuum, I feel like it's a little bit meh. Um, but the fact that it could theoretically gain you so much card advantage and become such a big game ender if you're really abusing the foretold mechanic, uh, there's there's potential for this. Um, what's really cool about this is it's another modal double face card. So the other side of this is Haka Whispering Raven. Now this is a 2-3 flying legendary creature bird for one blue and one colorless. Whenever Haka Whispering Raven deals combat damage to a player, return it to its owner's hand, then scry two. Now this is a really cool, really, really cool card. Um, obviously you can't really play it in an aggressive deck, um, but what it's great at is if you need a 2-drop that is uh, protection from the opponent being really aggressive, you can drop this as a 2-3 flyer that you can use as a blocker for a couple turns, and then once you have like 5 or more mana where you could have cast the god side, you can swing with it, deal 2 damage, scry 2, return it to your hand, and then cast it as the god, which means now you know the next two cards that are coming up. So when you cast it as the card, and then the end, end of your turn trigger happens, where you have to choose a card type and reveal cards from the top, you now know what those cards are. So there's a really cool synergy between both sides of this card, where you're returning the bird to your hand and scrying so that you can replay it as Alrund and then get automatic card advantage off of knowing what's coming next and knowing what kind of card to name so that you can get those cards in your hand. Uh, that seems really, really cool. We'll see how powerful it ends up being in practice. Again, it really depends on, I think, how powerful Fortel is going to be. But um, it's really, really interesting that the two sides of this card work so well together and can work in such an interesting way. So it'll be interesting to see just how far we can push Fortel uh, with a card like this. Moving on, we've got Auron's Epiphany. Now, this is a sorcery for two blue mana and five colorless. Create two 1-1 one, one blue bird creature tokens with flying. Take an extra turn after this one. Exile Alrun's Epiphany. You can foretell it for two blue and four colors. Now, first of all, any card that lets you take an extra turn, you need to watch out for. These cards, they always seem to find a way to be abused, and the last thing I want to see is another Nexus infinite turn deck. Oh god. Shut up! I don't think this is abusable in that way. I think the Exile Clause is specifically there because of that. I mean, it would be really fun in a deck with a bunch of double visions and a bunch of cards that can copy double vision. So you get like, I don't know, six double visions on the field and then play it and get like seven turns. That would be cool, but it wouldn't be infinite, right? And you'd have to do an awful lot of setup. It's possible but it's kind of jank, so I'm cool with it. Moving on, we've got Vorinclex, Monstrous Raider. Now, this guy leaked a while back, and he is an absolute beast. Uh, 
one of the most powerful cards in the set for sure. And I think some people don't even realize just how powerful he is. Now, he's a 6-6 six, six Trample Haste for 2 green and 4. He's a legendary creature, Phyrexian Praetor. If you would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, put twice that many of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead. If an opponent would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, they put half that many of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead. Rounded down. Now, this is freaking nuts. This is absolutely nuts. So, first of all, you need to understand that this completely shuts, shuts down sagas. Uh, if your opponent tries to play a saga, they never get to put a lore counter on it. Uh, the lore counters get rounded down to putting zero on. The saga never gets a lore counter, it never triggers any of its chapters, and it's basically just a dead card. Now it does get to sit there so that if they eventually get rid of Vorinclex, then the chapters will start to trigger, but while Vorinclex is on the field, Sagas do nothing. It completely shuts down your opponent's Sagas. Not only that, it mostly shuts down your opponent's Planeswalkers. I mean, if they have a 5 loyalty Planeswalker and they drop it, it's now coming into play with only 2 loyalty counters. And all of its plus 1 abilities don't even work because they can't put the counter on. It just seems insane, right? Uh, normally, it's like the minus three ability in that instance. That would be the most powerful, where you drop the Planeswalker and it can use that ability to kill something or to protect itself in some way. Um, and you you cut its legs off, basically, by taking away the ability to use that as soon as the Planeswalker comes out. You take away the ability for them to uptick the Planeswalker, unless it's a plus two, and you basically nerf all of their Planeswalkers into the ground. But what's more important than that, all of your Planeswalkers become supercharged. So, like, you could play a Planeswalker with 5 loyalty, and it's going to come into play with 10 loyalty on it. That's just insane. All of your Planeswalkers are now entering the battlefield, as long as Vorinclex is on the battlefield when you play them. They are entering the battlefield with double loyalty, with enough loyalty to use their ultimate ability on the turn that you play them. That's just broken. In the case of the new Kaya that I already spoiled, her ultimate gives you an emblem that lets you play any legendary creature from exile. Any any legendary creature, anything, any legendary permanent, any legendary creature or planeswalker from exile, from your graveyard, or from your hand for free once a turn. So it's like, if you manage to get a Kaya into play after Vorinclex, and you activate the ultimate immediately, now it doesn't even matter if they kill Kaya or the Vorinclex, or even if they exile them, you can just get them back with the emblem every turn. So, that seems really powerful, and I'll absolutely be making a deck that does that, but this card is just bonkers, and I've heard some people on YouTube talking about how it's its problem is it's kind of a do-nothing, the turn you cast it, you drop it for six mana and it does nothing, and I don't agree with that. Granted, it doesn't do what you want it to do on the turn you play it, but it has haste, right? So it's never going to do nothing. You're going to drop it, you're going to swing in with it. At the very least, they're going to have to maybe trade with it with another creature, or chump block it, or take six damage. So it's not doing nothing, it's absolutely doing something the turn it comes into play, and if it manages to survive for a turn, Oh my god, the power this thing can can give you is just absolutely absurd. Uh, expect to see this broken everywhere, and in fact, it might even be Omnath level, and I wouldn't be completely surprised to see this banned in standard uh, pretty shortly after the set coming out. I'm hoping that doesn't happen, I'm hoping this thing doesn't catch on like crazy, but don't count it out. <laughs> don't count it out just yet, because this, this thing is just a monster. Moving on, we've got Nico Eris. Now, this is a Planeswalker that's been spoiled. It is a three loyalty Planeswalker, legendary Planeswalker Nico, for two blue, one white, and X mana. Now, when Nico Eris enters the battlefield, create X shard tokens. These tokens are enchantments with pay to sacrifice it to scry one and draw a card. Now, you can uptick Nico Eris plus one and up to one target creature you control can't be blocked this turn. Whenever that creature deals damage this turn, 
return it to its owner's hand. You can minus one Nico Eris to deal two damage to target tapped creature for each card you've drawn this turn, or you can minus one Nico Eris to create a shard token. Now, this card is super interesting, and it's kind of the polar opposite from what we normally expect from a Planeswalker. It doesn't really have an ultimate ability that you build up to over time. Uh, the closest thing it has to an ultimate is the thing that happens when you play it. If you draw this in the late game and you pay a ton of mana for X, you're getting a ton of shard tokens. And this, this is something that can be really, really abused. If you're playing constellation cards like Archon or, or uh, Citizen Champion, and you play Nico Eris late game for, say, five mana spent on X, you're making five enchantments on the spot. You can trigger Constellation five times. With Citizen Champion, you're drawing five cards and putting five counters on it. With Archon, you're making five 2-2 two -two Flying Pegasus tokens. Like, this card can be absurd in the late game in the right deck where enchantments matter, but its loyalty abilities are nothing to scoff at either. Being able to plus one and potentially return something to your hand that has an enters the battlefield ability that you can recast seems pretty powerful. Or, or even just plus one to make something unblockable. You could use this to make a dream trawler unblockable and swing in for a bunch of damage. Or just maybe like a skyclave apparition or some smaller guy that you just want to return to your hand and immediately replay him so that you can get the enters the battlefield ability. Like, the plus one can definitely be utilized in a lot of different ways. Uh, the second ability, the minus one, being able to take out a creature, uh, granted it's very situational, you need to draw cards in order to increase how much damage you can deal, and you can only deal that damage to a tapped creature, but it's still really powerful. Having built-in removal on a stick, that's always a powerful ability for a Planeswalker. So granted, you have to play around it to make it work, but even at the very least, just dropping it and down taking it to shock something uh, to help clear up the board a little bit on the opponent's side, like, even that's not so bad. It still leaves you with two loyalty tokens, or two loyalty counters, and uh, a planeswalker that they have to deal with. And then you can also minus one to create another shard. So, like, you could drop this thing for five mana, make two shards, and then down tick it to make another shard, and get three shards in just one turn. And even if they deal with the Planeswalker by wasting a removal spell or wasting attacks or what have you, you still have a bunch of shard tokens that you can sacrifice to draw cards, and you gained a bunch of card advantage. So I think this guy can be used in a lot of different ways, and uh, I think they're just super, super cool. So moving on, we've got Valky, God of Lies. Now, Valky is another modal double face card, and this is Tybalt. This is the Tybalt we all deserve because we've been waiting for a good Tybalt for so friggin' long. And finally, we have one that's amazing. So Valky God of Lies is one black and one colorless for a legendary creature god. It's a 2-1. When Valky enters the battlefield, each opponent reveals their hand. For each opponent, exile a creature card they revealed this way until Valky leaves the battlefield. You may pay X mana, Choose a creature card exiled with Valky with converted mana cost X, and Valky becomes a copy of that card. Now, what's cool about this is you can make them get rid of something that you have enough mana to copy that turn, and then instantly have Valky become a copy of it, and now you're able to play another Valky next turn, because once the original Valky becomes a copy of the other creature, it doesn't know it's Valky anymore. It doesn't know it's a legendary creature god. So you can then play another Valky. So this card kind of gets around the legendary clause in a really interesting way. Now, granted, whatever that you remove, they can just kill Valky and get it back, right? And they can get it back before you can turn Valky into it. Uh, and in that way, this card kind of reminds me a lot of like Hostage Taker, where you have a window where you have to make sure you turn Valky into the thing you remove before they get rid of it so that they don't get that thing back. Um, and that creates a really interesting sort of game within a game that you have to play of who's going to get to Valky first. Um, and I think that's really, really cool. But the other side is where the power of this card truly, si uh, truly shines. Now, this is Tybalt, Cosmic Imposter. It's Rakdos, 
It's five loyalty planeswalker for one black, one red, and five colorless. Uh, as Tybalt enters the battlefield, you get an emblem with you may play cards exiled with Tybalt Cosmic Imposter, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. That already seems pretty powerful as long as this guy can exile uh, pretty consistently. So let's move on to the loyalty abilities. Plus two, exile the top card of each player's library. That's basically like draw two, because now you can play those cards and use mana of any color to play them. So the plus two is basically draw two cards, which already seems kind of nutty. Then you've got minus three, exile target artifact or creature. So you can immediately remove the most problematic bomb artifact or creature on the board that your opponent has. And then because you have the emblem, even if they kill the Tibble, at any time you want, you can replay that artifact or creature yourself. So that seems insane. And then his ultimate is minus eight. Exile all cards from all graveyards and add three red mana. I don't know why you also get three red mana, because just exiling all cards from all graveyards is insane. Now you need to remember, Tybalt doesn't need to stay around in order for you to play all of these exiled cards. As soon as Tybalt enters the battlefield, you get an emblem that lets you play all of the exiled cards. So as long as, as long as you manage to exile some of these cards before they get rid of the Tybalt, you now have a bunch of card advantage that you can play whenever you feel like it at the perfect opportune moment. So this is just insanely powerful. Granted, it costs seven mana, but it almost doesn't matter. This is absolutely the top end of a Rakdos control or a Grixis control deck. And the power level in this is just absurd. The fact that the ultimate also gives you three red mana is just insane gravy. Like, if you exile all cards from all graveyards and can now play all of those cards for the rest of the game via an emblem that they can never get rid of, like, that's almost you win the game. That's pretty much as close as you get to you just win the game. And it's insane. What makes this even crazier is if you play this card in a Luris deck, you can actually play the Tybalt Cosmic Imposter side for seven mana from the graveyard with Luris's ability. Because technically, Valky is the front side of the card. So Luris looks at Valky and sees Valky in the graveyard and says, you're allowed to play this card. And then when playing it, you decide which side to play it as. So you can play an insane endgame 7 mana Planeswalker from your graveyard with Luris, and that's just nutty. Like, this card is absolutely freaking mind-blowingly insanely good, and you're gonna see it everywhere. It's basically the new Ugin. It is the new ramp to it and win the game card coming out of Call Time. And I'm super excited to see what I can do with this thing because it's just nuts. Moving on. We've got uh, Friday's cards. That was just Thursday. So we've gone over Wednesday and Thursday. And now we've got Friday. So these are the last cards spoiled uh, for the first week of Call Time Spoilers. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, the dual lands. Now, we got a dual land for every color combination that is a snow land. Now granted, these cards come into play tapped, so that's a downside, but the fact that they're snow lands, they're dual lands, and they count as their basic land types, they don't count as basic lands, but they count as plains, as swamps, as forests, as mountains, as islands. You can use things like Birth of Miletus to find one of these dual lands that has white in it, because it count, counts as a planes. The fact that you get that extra value on top of snow lands that are dual lands is nuts. The fact that they're common is crazy. Like, these lands are good. Don't get me wrong. You don't want to touch them if you're not going into snow. But if you're playing a snow deck that wants to run multiple colors, these cards are freaking awesome. And the fact that you can interact with them for being plains or swamp or whatever land type is nuts and i expect these cards to see a fair amount of play in anything that's multicolor that's trying to push a, a snow agenda moving on we've got glittering frost 
Now this is a green snow enchantment aura for one green and two colorless. Enchant land. Enchanted land is snow. Whenever enchanted land is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional one mana of any color. So this is really cool fixing for limited. Turns the land into a snow land. Um, so you can see probably snow decks picking this up to fix their mana base. Or it's, def it's decent fixing for really, really any deck running green uh, in a limited environment. So I think this will be pretty cool uh, for draft particularly. Moving on, we've got Seize the Spoils. Now this is a sorcery for one red and two colorless. As an additional cost to cast this spell, discard a card, draw two cards, and create a treasure token. So this is this set's version of like discard a card, draw two cards. It costs one more mana, but you get a treasure token out of it. It could be relevant. It remains to be seen how relevant the uh, treasure token synergies are. Um, if there are enough cards pushing the whole hey, have a lot of treasure tokens and we care kind of mentality, then this could be worth playing. But otherwise, you know, this is filler for the set to, to really fill it out. Moving on, we've got Coma's Faithful. Now this is a 3-1 elf cleric with lifelink for one black and two colorless mana. When Coma's Faithful dies, each player mills three cards. It's an elf, it's a cleric, it has relevant creature types and that matters. It's a 3-1 lifelink. It can trade up pretty well uh, in limited environments. And it mills you three cards, so there is potential for this to be used in some kind of tribal mill deck, if that ends up being a thing, with it having the, the relevant creature types and also milling you three cards. I wouldn't count this card out completely from being something you see in constructed play, although there has to be just the right deck for it to slot into for it to be worth playing. So... Pretty cool and limited. We'll see where it goes in Constructed. Moving on, we've got Village Rights. Yes, they're bringing Village Rights back already. Now, Village Rights is a cool card. I'm glad to see it. You know, whenever you cast this spell, sacrifice a creature, draw two cards. One black mana. Super cool card. I love it. Uh, what I like about this version is the art looks really, really great. So, I'm glad to see Village Rights come back. Um, I'd rather see a new card. But out of anything that could have come back in the in the common slot, uh, Village Rights is pretty good. So I'm glad they picked this. I think there's a lot you could do with it. Moving on, we've got Sculptor of Winter. Now this is a 2-2 snow creature elf rogue for one green and one colorless mana. You can tap it to untap target snow land. This seems pretty cool, right? Uh, this is ramp. This essentially taps for a mana. Uh, the thing about it is you get a mana of a color that a snow land you control could produce. So you're going to want to run this in a deck with snow lands. It seems like decent fixing or ramp for a snow deck. Um, now it's not going to fix you as far as a splash color is concerned. But it will fix you as far as finding the second mana of a certain color. If you haven't drawn the second land of that color yet. So it makes it a little easier to run... Um, cards that take more of a, a color commitment that have more devotion to a color um, in a multicolor deck. So this should be cool. I mean, any kind of ramp in a limited environment is pretty good. And the creature types matter with it being an elf and a rogue. So in limited, should be cool. Um, I have no idea if this will do anything in constructed. It really depends on how snow takes off. Moving on, we've got raven form. Now this is probably the best blue removal we've seen in a long long time let alone uh let alone at common at the common rarity so this is a sorcery for one blue and two colorless uh exile target artifact or creature its controller creates a one one blue bird creature token with flying and you can foretell it for one blue mana honestly the foretell is just gravy the fact that you can exile any creature and also edge value any artifact if you need to. But the fact that you can exile any creature in blue for three mana or potentially even one mana if you have the, the two colorless to set it aside at an earlier turn, like, that's just nutty. Like, most times the 1-1 one, one blue bird creature token with flying, like, we s won't even matter. We saw how broken Oko was because he could turn anything into a 3-3 elk. Uh, now, granted, Oko was reusable and this isn't. 
but they only get a 1-1 blue bird out of this rather than a 3-3 elk. So this is crazy. Like blue has straight up removal, exile removal for any creature or artifact and all they get is a 1-1 out of it. Like this is the best common removal I've seen in blue in pretty much as long as I can remember. And it's absolutely going to be picked high in draft. Anyone that's running blue and might not be dipping into colors that are, are known for their removal is absolutely going to pick these up early. So this card is nuts in limited. It's probably going to see constructed play as well because now you don't need to worry about using a color that has good removal in your blue deck in order to have good removal. So like, yeah, play this card. Moving on. We've got Bretagard Stronghold. Now, this is a land. It's an uncommon land. Uh, it's not a legendary land. It enters the battlefield tapped. You can tap it for a green mana, but you can also pay two white and one green and tap it and sacrifice it to put a plus one, plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures you control. They gain vigilance and lifelink until end of turn. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. Now, this card's really interesting. Uh, only certain decks are really going to be able to take advantage of it. And because of that, I don't think most decks will want to use the slot to play it uh, because this comes into the battlefield tapped. But for a card that gives plus one, plus one counters like this does, as well as the gravy of Vigilance and Lifelink, in the right deck, this could be great. Uh, what comes to mind for me is the plus one, plus one counters matters deck with uh, Conclave Mentors. If you're using this in that deck, you can do so much with this card. The fact that you can get extra plus one, plus one counters with the Conclave Mentor just seems pretty nuts. Uh, the fact that it comes from a land that's uncounterable also seems pretty nuts. Um, again, it's not going to be used in everything. It coming in tapped really does matter and really does make you only want to use this card in the decks that are really going to take advantage of those counters. But in the decks that do that, this is absolutely great. This can be that extra little bit of push that really helps the plus one, plus one counters deck get there. Uh, it's pretty powerful and not quite tier one right now. And this card could be possibly in conjunction with one or two more cards. The card's that push it over the edge and really make it something competitive. Um, it'll be interesting to try using this card in that kind of an archetype. Moving on, we've got Giant's Amulet. Now, Giant's Amulet is a equipment card for one blue mana. It's an artifact equipment. When Giant's Amulet enters the battlefield, you may pay an extra one blue and three colorless. If you do, create a 4-4 blue giant wizard creature token, then attach Giant's Amulet to it. Equipped creature gets plus zero, plus one, and has. This creature has hexproof as long as it's untapped. Equip it for two colorless mana. Now, you should not underestimate any ability that gives something hexproof. This is very, very powerful. This can make any of your creatures essentially unkillable when you need them to be unkillable. But what's really great about this is for five mana, you're also getting a four, four giant wizard along with it and you can break this card by finding ways to flicker giant's amulet because what's cool about it is it's not a kicker cost you don't have to pay the extra mana when you play the giant's amulet you can pay the extra mana when it enters the battlefield which means you don't have to recast it you can flicker this and when it enters the battlefield again you can pay the four mana again make another four four giant wizard this seems crazy, and I think it's just begging to be broken. If you can find ways to just keep flickering the Giant's Amulet, you can keep making 4-4s four for as long as you can flicker it. And having the equipment left over to give whatever you want hexproof whenever you need to give it hexproof just seems really, really good. Uh, I wouldn't quite say this card is broken, but it's definitely good, and it'll be interesting to see what kind of decks crop up that really take advantage of it and really utilize it. Deck, uh, utilize it. Is this going in the giant deck? Is it going in a wizard deck? Is it just going in a deck that runs blue that has really good creatures that you want to protect with, protect with hexproof? Uh, it should be interesting to see where this thing lands. Next up, we've got Hailstorm Valkyrie. Now, this is a 2-2 snow creature angel wizard for one black and three colorless. 
has flying and trample, and you can pay two snow mana to give Hailstorm Valkyrie plus two plus two until end of turn. Now, this seems pretty good on the surface, but I don't think it's quite constructed worthy. A 2-2 two -two flying trample on turn four, it's just too much do nothing for four mana. Uh, in limited, it could be really good. If you're playing this in a snow deck specifically, um, anything with evasion in limited is nuts. So having flying and trample and the ability in the late game to really pump this guy, this guy up and make him really huge um, to, to trample over or fly over for the win uh, seems really, really good. In limited, I think this guy is really powerful. But in constructed, he's just too much mana and doesn't give you anything the turn it comes out. So I don't know if this is quite usable and constructed. If you disagree, let me know in the comments. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like this gets passed over and constructed, but it's absolutely awesome in just the right uh, limited archetypes. Uh, moving on, we've got Path to the World Tree. Now this is an enchantment for one green and one colorless. When Path to the World Tree enters the battlefield, search your library for a basic land, uh, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Uh, you can pay one mana of each color and two colorless, sacrifice Path to the World Tree. You gain two life and draw two cards, target opponent loses two life, uh, Path to the World Tree deals two damage to up to one target creature, and you create a 2-2 green bear creature token. This seems pretty cool. Um, this is almost like a green Birth of Melodis. Uh, you can use this to uh, find a basic land, any basic land, put it into your hand so it's fixing. You can, you can flicker it with Yorian um, the same way you'd flicker like an omen or something to re-trigger it, get another land. You can do things like that. Uh, and then late game, if it happens to still be around, you can sack it to get a bunch of extra value. Drawing two cards, potentially killing a thing, draining two life, making a 2-2. A two -two. Like, all of that is pretty good, as long as you're not relying on it. As long as it's just gravy. As long as this thing works in your deck as just a, hey, we need to fetch another land for two mana, we need to fix our mana, and... We want to have an enchantment on the field for some kind of synergy with that. If your deck utilizes all of those things, then the seven mana ultimate ability at the end being gravy is really, really good. But you can't really put this in a deck specifically aiming to use that seven mana ability because it's just a little too niche. And um, I think there's plenty of decks that will really make good use of the primary ability of this card um, and then potentially be able to use the, the ultimate ability in the late game if the situation calls for it. So I think this card's actually really, really cool. Uh, moving on, we've got the Trickster God's Heist. Now, I love Sagas, obviously. I love Demir, so I am super excited about this card. This is a Demir Saga for one black and one blue and two colorless. Page one is you may exchange two uh, you may exchange control of two target creatures. Page two is you may exchange control of two target non basic non creature permanents that share a card type. And page three is target player loses three life and you gain three life. Now, in just the right deck. I think this card could be really freaking good. Um, imagine playing it in like a deck with a Whisper Squads, where you're just getting a bunch of Whisper Squads into play. Maybe because of Ayara, or maybe you're running Luris, or you know maybe it's Black Devotion or whatever. And then you can just give them a Whisper Squad for whatever you want. That seems great. Give them a Skyclave Shade, you know. And then when it dies because they can only attack with it and they can't block you. You block it with something, it dies, and it goes back to your graveyard so you can replay it. Like, there's a lot of really cool ways to get around the downside of this. Give them things that you don't mind necessarily giving them, and getting something really good in return. The fact that this is stapled onto a saga so that you can flicker it and reuse it to do that sort of thing um, makes it really interesting, and I'm really excited to see how this card could be utilized. Uh, page 2 and page 3 are both kind of gravy. Uh, page 2 can be really powerful in the right circumstances. It's worth noting, you could actually trade the Trickster God's Heist itself to another player for a really powerful enchantment. 
So say they play Elspeth Conker's death and they have something really nasty they're going to get out of their graveyard, you can give them the Trickster God's Heist. Now, granted, page three is going to hit for them and you're going to lose the three life and they're going to gain the three life, but that's probably negligible next to being able to get any creature or planeswalker back from your graveyard with a page three of an Elspeth Conker's death and denying your opponent the ability to get back the powerful thing they were going to get back all in one swing. Like, it seems like there's a lot this card can do. You definitely need to build around it, but I'm excited to see what kind of decks could possibly pop up to really take advantage of this card because it's it looks super fun. Uh, it's also worth noting that page three helps to enable some of the gain three life triggers that we saw in Corset. So um, maybe there's a world where this card gets played with some of those cards that trigger whenever you gain three life in a turn. Um, and in fact, those cards are probably go up in value as something you can give to your opponent with page one, because if their deck is not built around taking advantage of gaining three life a turn um, to, to get those effects, those cards that do those things are going to go way down in value for them. So you almost don't mind giving them those cards uh, and getting something big, and then also in page three, triggering those abilities for whatever whatever of those cards you still have around. Um, there's really interesting ways this card can be used, and I'm really excited to see, to see how far we can push it. Uh, moving on from that one, we've got our first rare that was uh, dropped on Friday, and that's Reflections of Litjara. Now, this is an enchantment for one blue and four. As Reflections of Lejara enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Whenever you cast a spell of the chosen type, copy that spell. I want to love this card so much. It seems super fun that you get an extra copy of literally everything you play as long as you're playing a tribe. Um, it seems especially fun in like a changeling deck where you're just playing a bunch of changelings and you can make copies of all those changelings and just do a bunch of nutty stuff. Um, I want to love it. It seems super fun. The problem it has is the problem that a lot of cards have where it's five whole mana. You need to drop this on turn five and just do nothing else and just hope that your opponent doesn't crush you by the time the next turn comes around so that you can start to take advantage of it. And that feels a little bad so i don't know if this card will quite make the cut but if there are any crazy combos running around that can really take advantage of this i don't know maybe there's a nutty deck out there where this actually gets used at the very least it's going to be a super fun card to play in casual um and i don't know we'll, we'll see where it goes but uh i love the card and i hope i'm wrong and i hope this thing can can do a lot of work because it seems super fun Next card, we've got uh, Cosmos Charger. Now, this is a 3-3 three, three creature horse spirit for one blue and three colorless. It has flash and flying, and foretelling cards from your hand costs one less and can be done on any player's turn. And you can foretell it for a blue and two mana. Uh, this seems awesome. This might be the card that foretell needs, or it might be a dud. Now, the problem is you need to get this in play for a whole four mana, or if you foretell it, five mana split across multiple turns. Um, before you can start to take advantage of the fact that now you can foretell during another player's turn, or, and for one less mana. Um, but if you can get this into play, which it having flash really helps, um, you can do a lot of busted stuff with this. I mean, you flash this into play at the end of their turn, while holding up counter magic if you don't need to counter something and now all of a sudden you can just hold up mana every turn counter whatever you need to remove things at instant speed if you need to and if you don't need to do things you can just start foretelling cards left and right for one mana at instant speed or not at instant speed but during your opponent's turn uh at whatever speed that that card is so if it is an instant you can do it at instant speed during their turn and then just tuck all these cards away uh to use whenever it seems like it could be really good in a control deck it's fragile because you need to get this thing out there and it needs to stay out there but 
if foretelling is powerful enough, and I feel like kind of a broken record at this point because I keep saying that, but if the foretel foretelling deck uh, ends up being powerful enough and that synergy really ends up being pushed enough, which this card is absolutely helping to do that, um, you could see this being nuts. You could see the ability to foretell for less mana and during the opponent's turn as being something really powerful. We'll have to see what the rest of the set brings, but it's possible that this card is is the real deal. We've got, next up, Kalvori, God of Kinship. Now, this is a 2-4 legendary creature god for 2 green mana and 2 colorless. As long as you control 3 or more legendary creatures, Kalvori gets plus 4, plus 2, and has vigilance. Pay 1 green and 1, tap it, Look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a legendary creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And if that isn't crazy enough, it's a modal double face card. And the other side, you can play it as an artifact called the Ring Heart Crest. Now this is a legendary artifact for one green and one colorless. As the Ring Heart Crest enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Tap it to add a green. Spend this mana only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type or a legendary creature spell. There's so much going on with this card. Uh, first of all, the artifact side. Obviously, you need to use it in a tribal deck or in a changeling deck or in a legendary theme deck. But even that alone, those are three different options. There's, I feel, a lot of different ways you could potentially put this artifact to good use. Spending two mana for an artifact that taps for one is pretty powerful in the recent standard formats. Uh, when you go as far back as like Legacy and Vintage, like this is this is kind of overcosted. But when you're looking in the grand scheme of the last few years, this is actually really really good priced uh, artifact ramp. So there is the stipulation that you need the specific creature type or you need it to be legendary but i think in the right decks you can get around that and this can be a really good mana rock but the other side of it being the god being potentially a 6-6 if you're playing it with enough legendary creatures and being able to sift through and have card selection for just the right card from the top six seems like it could be good in the right deck. I feel like this guy really wants to be used in a legendary centric deck where it is just uh, popping out legendaries left and right. It's ramping up. This thing's becoming big. You're constantly gaining card advantage from the tap ability. Is it good enough to stand toe to toe with other tier one constructed decks? Probably not, but we don't know what the rest of the set will bring. So if there are enough cards that continue to support this kind of legendary theme, a card like this could be really, really useful, and a deck like this could really take off. Next up, we've got Calamity Bearer. Now, Calamity Bearer is a 3-4 creature giant berserker for 2 red mana and 2 colorless mana. If a giant source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. Now, it really depends on how, how giants take off, um, but this seems like, and I feel like a broken record again, but this seems like it could be really powerful. If the giant deck is good enough and the giant threats are powerful enough, uh, doubling all of that damage just seems pretty crazy. So it'll be really interesting to see what the giant deck looks like, how aggro it ends up being, and if a card like this actually has a slot in it. In limited, it's absolutely bonkers, as long as you can actually draft the giants that you need. But in constructed, it's really going to depend on how playable the giant deck is and what direction the giant deck goes. Is it aggro? Is it mid-range? Is it control? I doubt it. But we'll see what happens. All right, we're finally closing in on the end of it. Now, I know this video has been insanely long, and if you're still around, 
thank you for staying until the end and checking all of these out. Uh, so we've got four Mythics left and then my favorite card that was announced in the first week of spoilers. Uh, so the first Mythic is Goldspan Dragon. Now Goldspan Dragon is a 4-4 Flying Haste Dragon for two red mana and three colorless, so a total of five. Whenever Goldspan Dragon attacks or becomes the target of a spell, create a treasure token. Treasures you control have tap, sacrifice this artifact, add two mana of any one color. Now, it really depends how powerful the whole treasure token theme is, but it seems to me there could be a deck with dwarves and magda that use treasures to find this dragon and then turn all of your treasures into basically double treasures. Um, and the fact that you also get treasures whenever it's targeted by a spell means even if they remove it, you get left with a little bit of upside with these treasures. And it has haste, so it can swing the turn it comes into play and the turn that you find it by sacrificing treasures to Magda. And that just seems like it could end up being relevant. It could end up being powerful enough to actually be a deck archetype. Will it actually be competitive in the end? We'll have to see where the rest of the... the cards that are kind of themed with that with the dwarves and the treasures and so on and so forth go but um there's absolutely a chance that a card like this could see a deck build up around it in that fashion uh moving on we've got tyvar kel now tyvar kel is a planeswalker it's one of our planeswalkers it is a three loyalty planeswalker for two green and two colorless uh it has a static ability elves you control have tap Add one black mana to your mana pool. Its plus one loyalty ability is put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target elf, untap it, it gains death touch until end of turn. It has a loyalty ability of zero, create one one green elf warrior creature token, and then minus six loyalty is you get an emblem with whenever you cast an elf spell, it gains haste until end of turn and you draw two cards. This thing is great in an elf themed deck. Uh, this is basically an elf lord in Planeswalker form. Uh, I think the static ability is really powerful and more powerful than, than people probably realize right now. Uh, if you just crap out a bunch of elves really quick and then slam this thing down, you can then use those elves to basically make a bunch more mana the same turn you play this. So a lot of times, if this is played in the right deck that's built around it, it's almost like you play it for free right? Because you slam four elves down over the first three turns, and then turn four you play this, and now your four elves can all tap for black mana, so you can play another four drop, as long as it's a black card, um, and then keep going, and that alone is pretty awesome, but then you add in, add in the loyalty abilities, and how it can, it can uh, beef up your elves, it can give you more elves, um, it just seems pretty powerful. Uh, being able to draw extra cards off the ultimate is nice. Having that card advantage is nice, but I really the power comes from the static ability. And I feel like all of the loyalty abilities on this are just kind of gravy. And uh, I think if the elf deck is good enough, this card's just going to be bonkers. Next up is another modal double face card. Now this is the green god, Asika, god of the tree. For two green and one colorless, it is a legendary creature god. It is a 1-4 with vigilance. You can tap it to add one mana of any color. And other legendary creatures you control have vigilance and tap to add one mana of any color. So just like uh, the other green card we were looking at earlier, this supports the legendary theme in green. So I really think a legendary matters deck is springing up with green at its core. And it's going to be really interesting to see if a deck like that can actually take off. Because having to balance the idea of the legendary cards being really powerful, but not being able to play multiple copies is really interesting. And with all of these new modal double face cards, you can kind of get around the legendary clause a bit. Because if you draw a second copy, you can just play it as the thing that's on the other side. So it's not completely dead in your hand. And I love that about these new modal legendary cards. So it'll be really interesting to see if something like this can take off a lot easier now because you have these, these legendaries that uh, aren't necessarily dead in your hand if you're cramming a whole playset into your deck. Uh, the other side of this card is 
the Prismatic Bridge. Now, this is a legendary enchantment for one mana of each color. At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Obviously, this is freaking powerful. I mean, you need to be playing every color to play it. it I really wonder if this is going to be used in a deck that's crammed uh, with creatures and planeswalkers, where you're just constantly fishing something out every turn, or if maybe it'll be used kind of like Luca or Transmogrify, and you'll only have a very few key creatures or planeswalkers in your deck, and you'll use this to basically tutor up just the right one and get it onto the battlefield for free. Um, this could be really, really powerful if it's used either way. It really depends on how the deck pans out, but if the legendary deck if the Legendary Matters deck really starts to get more pieces like this and come together, that deck could be super fun and it could be really competitive. So seeing it get support like this is really, really exciting. And I, I really want to see, there's so many cards in this, this set that I really want to see how they get used and where they end up. And this is absolutely one of them. Uh, moving on to the last mythic before we get to my favorite card of the day. This is one of my favorite cards of the day. This is Coma, Cosmo Serpent. Now, this is a 6-6 six, six legendary creature serpent for 2 blue, 2 green, and 3 colorless. This spell can't be countered. At the beginning of each upkeep, create a 3-3 three, three blue serpent creature token named Coma's Coil. Sacrifice another serpent to choose one. Either tap target permanent and its activated abilities can't be activated this turn, or... Coma Cosmo Serpent gains indestructible until end of turn. This is an absolute bomb. It's super powerful. I've been waiting for just the right creature that would actually be a good recursion target for a recursion deck, and this thing is super powerful uh, if it's used in that way. But the fact that it can't be countered if it's hard cast is awesome. Um, there are a few things about this card that are easily overlooked. First of all, you get a 3-3 Coma's Coil, every upkeep not just on your upkeep so you drop this say go and on their upkeep you immediately get a 3-3 three, three, uh coma's coil serpent token uh that you can use as soon as they try to play any kind of sorcery speed removal on coma you could sacrifice that coil to protect so protect, to protect coma to give it indestructible or to tap down and deactivate any of their permanents and that seems really powerful. Another thing that you should keep in mind about this card is that it comes out in an environment full of changelings. Now, the one downside about Coma is there aren't very many serpents in the environment, but the fact that there are so many changelings coming in Kaldheim changes all of that because all of those changelings count as serpents, which means if you play this in a changeling deck and you drop it as your top end finisher, after playing out a bunch of changelings, now all of a sudden, all of those changelings you've been playing throughout the game, they're all serpents that can all be sacrificed to either save Coma or to tap down specific problem permanents and turn them off. So that seems really, really powerful. And then on top of that, you add to the fact that you can actually use this to shut down a Planeswalker. And it doesn't seem like that's the case at first, because you tap target permanent when you sacrifice a serpent. But that part of the ability doesn't matter with planeswalkers. You can still tap a planeswalker, even though there wouldn't be a reason to tap it, because the second part of the ability will still work. Its activated abilities can't be activated this turn. That means you could wait until their upkeep, make a 3-3 Coma's Coil, immediately sacrifice it during their upkeep to tap one of their planeswalkers, and keep them from being able to use any of that Planeswalker's loyalty abilities that turn, which seems really powerful. So like all of this kind of comes together and says to me that this card is going to be absolutely nuts, especially in Shapeshifter decks, especially as top end with it, with it not being able to be countered and possibly in recursion decks as that big seven drop we've been waiting for as a really, really good uh, recursion target that just turns into an engine that just builds you a board all by itself and protects itself so that it can just stick around and win the game. Absolutely powerful card. Can't wait to brew with it.
Uh, moving on to the last card of the day, and my favorite, and po probably the most abusable. I expect to see this card everywhere. This is the World Tree. This is a land. It enters the battlefield tapped. You can tap it for a green mana. As long as you control six or more lands, lands you control have tap to add any uh, tap to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. You may pay two mana of each color, tap it, sacrifice it to search your library for any number of god cards, put them onto the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. This card is insanely powerful, and it's going to be broken. Um, first of all, the fact that once you hit six lands, including it, all of your lands tap for whatever color you need, is just nutty. This is going to be the premier fixer in any deck that's trying to ramp up to six or more lands. Uh, you just get whatever you need. This is going to be a staple in every commander deck that runs green until the end of time. Um, and the fact that you have that amount of fixing built into this, built into a land, and it can't be countered is nutty. But the ultimate is insane. We've already seen that it's not hard to ramp up to a ton of mana to play something like an Ugin. Ugin ramp decks have been around forever. So what's another couple extra mana? And the fact that it requires two mana of each color to use this ultimate ability doesn't really matter because the world tree itself is making all of your lands tap for mana of any color as long as you have six or more in play. So all you need to do is ramp to 10 lands and you have the 10 mana of whatever colors you need to sack this thing, and then you're searching for any number of gods and putting them into play. This would be insanely powerful even if it was just the gods. There are lots of gods coming in Kaldheim, there are gods still from Theros, and there's more, more gods in, in legacy formats. But it seems like there's going to be plenty of gods to bring into play, and that this could be a, a game-ending ability even if you don't take into account the number one use for this, which is shapeshifters. With there being so many shapeshifters in this set, uh, shapeshifters.deck is absolutely going to be a thing, and if you think the world tree isn't going to be played in that deck, you're lying to yourself. This card is absolute gas. Can you imagine just bringing an entire deck of shapeshifters just boom, shitting them out onto the field all at once. I mean, if you bring the Gladewalker Ritualist, if you bring all four copies of a Gladewalker Ritualist into play at once with the World Tree, all of them see each other and trigger off of each other at the same time, and you draw 12 cards. All you need to do is have four Gladewalker Ritualists in your deck when you activate this ultimate ability, and you bring them all into play and draw 12 cards as well as all the other shapeshifters, as well as whatever other gods you want. You're triggering a ton of ridiculous shit. You're filling up your board. It's absolutely broken, and it's the number one deck I'm going to make as soon as Kaldheim hits. But that's the end of our spoilers. Finally, we are caught up with the first week. We are going to have more videos coming out soon to keep up with the day-to-day -day of each spoiler as it's announced. So definitely check out the, the future videos coming up. And until then, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. Uh, we are pushing hard for that 1,000 subscriber mark, so please consider subscribing. Hit that button. There's a circle in the middle over there. Hit that. Subscribe. Tell all your friends to do it. Thank you. Also, give this video a like so more people can see it. If you'd like more PlayStation and console game coverage, we've got that down below. And if you'd like more Magic the Gathering coverage, there's more of that somewhere off over that way. Do all the things.